to another edition of Inside Great Lakes Sailing. My name is Greg Norman, your host. We are fortunate enough today to have Ed Tyson, who is the uh, DYC's historian for life, also a DYR member and historian of the DYRA, and a longtime uh, DYC member and probably as knowledgeable about sailing and the history of sailing in Detroit area as anybody I, I've, I've had a chance to meet. So, Ed, thank you for coming aboard and, and having a conversation with us. And Glad to be here. It's a, an interesting position. Maybe explain what historians do, and then we can kind of get in where the, the sailing started and a little bit of your background and things of that nature. Well, what I have found over the years is that, surprisingly, most people's institutional memories do not exceed five years. There's very few people that have very little real knowledge from more than five years ago, which is very scary right. because people have no understanding of how we got to where we are today. And I mean, I look at my own club, we were formed in 1868 and that's a pretty long time ago. That's over 150 years and people have no idea. And there are absolutely no records prior to 1896, when our current corporation was incorporated. So I had to do a lot of digging because when I was Commodore in 1989, I had already written a series of articles for the main sheet, the DYC publication, on the history of the club. I got asked by Commodore Everingham in 1984 if I'd write a monthly article for the main sheet on history. And it became very popular, so I did it for several years. Uh, but it meant I had to look up all of this early history of the club, and I found out that virtually nothing existed. It was really hard to have to go back and just find little snippets that I could grab onto and try and piece together which I did over the years. And so we now have a, we were able to fill in the Commodores prior to 1884. We were missing about six of them. And uh, I found those out and put those in and a whole number of other uh, items that came up. I found out for instance, in 1887, there was a small article in the Detroit News and the article said that the Detroit Yacht Club was starting its 1887 sail sailing season. One of the requirements that if you wanted to race in a Detroit Yacht Club regatta in 1887 is that you had to agree to teach people to learn to sail. <laughs> 1887. I mean, this is a major, major, major commitment, and our club has had that commitment continuously since then. In 1928, we actually formed our adult sailing education program at DYC, and it's been going strong forever, ever since then. Is your background in history academic or just a uh, hobby? Um, let me put it this way. I was in the seminary, in Sacred Heart Seminary, and I graduated with a minor in history. Okay, so well, there's, there's a connection. To get a minor in history, you had to take what's called the graduate record exam. Yep. Well, when I took the graduate record exam in 1969, 
I went over the top. My score was the 99th percentile plus. And they said I had perhaps the highest score in the whole country on that exam. Now, the diocese was, of course, hoping that I would stay and I would get ordained. And then they'd send me back, get me a doctorate in history, and have me teach. Right. Unfortunately for them, I decided that staying in the seminary wasn't for me, and so I left. Um, I went on to get a degree in business because I looked after graduation, and my degree was a liberal arts degree with a major in philosophy. And as I've said, when you look in the papers, you never see an article that says, wanted, philosopher, good pay, good hours. It just doesn't work. Right. And right. I grew up in retail business. My father had a luggage store. We actually founded it in 1906. And so I went back and got a master's degree in business. So I have an MBA okay. and ended up working at a bank. I ran the store for a few years after my father was killed in a robbery and uh, finally decided in 76, I couldn't compete with all of the people that were moving into the big malls. I mean, I would have needed between a half a million to a million dollars to do it, and I didn't have it. So um, I decided it was time to close the store, and I went back into banking, and I enjoyed my career in banking. I was very successful at it. Sacred Heart was an interesting place. I spent a little time there, and my, my only joke, as I, as I said to you earlier, was that I had to, had to leave. Black wasn't my color, so you had, to, <laughs> you had to kind of move forward. Now, you didn't come to sailing too late, but talk a little bit, before we get into the sailing aspect of it, talk a little bit about your family, because you've been a, your family's been rock center in, in the city for, I what, a couple hundred years. <laughs> well, my father's family, the Tyson family, came over from Germany in 1840, because Germany had taken over uh, the Grand Duchy of Hesse, and they were drafting all of the young men into the Prussian army. My family didn't want to go into the Prussian army, so 14 brothers got on a boat, came over to Dearborn, and started farming in 1840. So that's how my father's family got here. My mother's family is a little different. My mother's family actually goes back to William Bradford and the Mayflower and settled in, of course, Massachusetts. I had an ancestor that fought with Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys in the Revolution. Wow. I had an ancestor that was a Minuteman at Lexington. Wow. I had an ancestor that fought at Bunker Hill. And I had an ancestor that fought in Cowpens. I also had three great-grandfathers that fought in the Civil War. And I, I, I've had ancestors in most of the wars that the country's ever fought. So yeah. I guess you could say I'm a, I'm a true-blooded American. Someone asked me once, they said, have you ever gone to check the records at Ellis Island that you know they might have historical information for me? And I said, I thought it was a terrific idea except my family came over so many years before Ellis Island, there's nothing there. Yeah. And I, I had an uncle who went back with history and the family. And I, I think eventually if we could go back far enough, we could probably find out that some great, 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 great something of my family and your family probably sat at a fire together at some point. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it, it, it is relatively close knit. It really is. Well, if you want, I don't know all of the links, but I do know that my family can be traced back to a knight of the realm of Charlemagne. Oh my God, that's amazing, <laughs> that's amazing. Well, well, what can I say? I mean, it, I, I don't know exactly how it flows because I've only gone back to the early 16, mid 1500s on both sides of the family. <laughs> so, I mean, so we're just far enough. I mean, you look back like that. And, right. So, so history, history was not only an avocation, it was a, it was a profession, so to speak. It was, it, so it's, I get that. Yeah, I guess. Now, you've been a longtime member of, a lifetime member at DYC, but you didn't come to sailing, I think, until the early 70s. Is that correct? 1971. What, ha what changed? What happened? What, what happened? Um, 
my family and all those years that they belong. Now, my great uncle was a first cousin of P.V. Boston, who was Skip Boston's grandfather. Okay. He was part owner of Surprise, P.V. Boston's racing boat. Well, my great uncle got married in 1898, and in 1900, they decided on uh, Emancipation Day that they would take their wives and girlfriends and go sailing and then picnic on Peach Island. Well, my great aunt found out very quickly that she got seasick as soon as she got on a boat. <laughs> After this was over and they got back home, she said, Charlie, you're selling that boat? She said, I'm not going out on it again. I'm tired of sitting home alone on Sundays. I'm tired of having your mother and sisters come over and tell me what a terrible housekeeper I am. So you're going to start staying home on Sundays instead of racing. And fortunately or unfortunately, he did. Yeah. And so um, he never really got went back to sailing. He tried to teach me when I was a little kid. And he bought a 7-Eleven dinghy, which we were using for instruction at the club, and took it out to our cottage. My family had a cottage in Canada on Lake Erie. And my great aunt said, Charlie, you're over 75 years old. How can you take a four-year-old kid out on a boat? You're going to kill him. <laughs> so that was the end of that. <laughs> um, so I spent my summers out on Lake Erie. My family bought the cottage in 1944, and I sold the cottage three years ago now. Okay. Uh, so we owned it for a good long time, and we're very happy out there. And I sold it to friends who lived, who were actually farmers, who lived almost across the road from us. So the, but, first, um, so the, the first time you step on a boat, 71. So, well, no, I was actually on boats all the time, but mainly power boats. When I was a little kid, sure. I'd go over to the club with my great aunt and uncle, and I was on the boat of every person that we knew at the club that owned a boat, because I loved boats. Right. And I think the funny story is 1955, I was in staying with my great aunt and uncle in the middle of the summer for a week because they came in for, for Venetian night at the club. And I talked my great aunt into stopping at Gregory Boat Company. So after we left, we're walking out to the car, and my great uncle is sitting in the car chuckling. And I didn't understand why. But after we left, Ed Gregory picked up the phone and called my father, because Ed Gregory was in charge of the golf league at the club, and any time he needed presents to give away at the golf outings, he'd come and see my father and my father would donate whatever he wanted. Right. So he called up and he said, Ed, yeah, Ed Gregory here. Yeah, my father figured he wanted some gifts for something. And he said, your son was just in my store with your aunt. Yes. Well, he picked out your new boat, a 45 foot Chris Craft flybridge. Whoa. My father said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and Ed said, I presume since you're a member of the club that you're going to dock it at the club. So I was just wondering when you wanted me to deliver the boat. And my father said, let me call you back on that. <laughs> so my father picked up the phone, called my mother, and he said, mother, because we always called her mother, never mom, never ma, mother, mother you know what your aunt did. And he proceeded to tell her. And then he said, should we buy the boat? And the problem was that while my great aunt would get sick the minute she stepped on a boat, and she's the one who raised my mother, my mother would get seasick if she just looked at a boat rocking in the water. And I had five sisters, all of whom were much more interested and being out at the cottage and going into town at night to roller skate and dance and everything with all the boys from the town and the cottages around us. Right. So they had no interest in having a boat at the club. They didn't care about boats. So my father finally decided that it wasn't the smart thing to do. Now, 
it's interesting because he felt that only rich people could afford boats. The fact that my father could afford to write a check to pay for a 45 foot boat in 1955, it never occurred to him that he really was better off than he ever considered himself to be. Sure. He preferred to give his money to charity, which was fine. And, well, that's, but, wasn't that a bit, that was the depression. That was the way those, that's the way those folks thought. That's the way, I mean, yes. Yeah, so no, I get I, it. I get he it. had some kind of tough times in the 30s. Sure. Oh, I'm sure he did. They all did. And even though we knew all kinds, I mean, he went to school with Chick Fisher, who was chairman of the board of National Bank of Detroit, and we were friends of the Ford family. I mean, my great grandfather gave Henry Ford his first line of credit. <laughs> You're looking at me with a very strange look. No, Would I you like I, that. No, no, Would I you like that story. Yeah. Well, Henry decided he was going to try and build Model Ts, but of course he'd gone bankrupt three times, so he couldn't get any money to start his new company. So he went out to visit my Uncle Bill on his farm in Dearborn, and he said, Mr. Tyson, yes, Henry, he said, I want to build some cars, and I need some wood for the frames and floorboards. And he said, I can't get any credit. Do you think I could cut down some trees on your farm? And he said, Henry, I've known you since you were born. You know, I mean, we sold your father his farm. And uh, he said, if you need a few trees, fine. Well, pretty soon he's in seeing my great grandfather, who was general manager of Restrick Lumber, which was the largest commercial lumber yard in Detroit at the time. And I said, Peter, my great grandfather, you got to do something about this Ford kid, or I won't have a tree left on my farm. And my great grandfather said, you go home and tell Henry. I want to see him in my office at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, sheepishly, Henry walks in his office hat in hand, and my great-grandfather said to him, Henry, you have to stop cutting down trees on my brother's farm, and you cannot cut down trees on any of my other brother's farms. He said, if you need lumber to build your cars, I will sell you lumber and I will provide credit. And Henry was, said that he was so grateful, he wanted to give my great grandfather 10% of the stock in his new company, the Ford Motor Company. My great grandfather said, Henry, we've known you all your life. You are not gonna give me stock. That, that has nothing to do with this transaction. This is a business transaction. I am selling you lumber on credit, and you will pay me for that lumber. No matter how long it takes, that's not important, but you will pay me for it, and that's all it is, is a straight business transaction. And that was the first line of credit the Ford Motor Company had. I, um, I lived in Florida, and I lived in the Fort Myers area, Bonita Beach, and, 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 and I, became, I was always a Ford freak, but I loved Edison, and it turned mm -hmm. out the two of them were very good friends. Yes. And they had cottages on the Kalahatchie River in Fort Myers. Right. They're now, they're now museums. And if you go into both of the homes, all of the newspaper clippings of that era that were written were clipped as history. And you can go through and read some of the accounts of their lives together and, and their process together. And it was, I think because we live here, we don't appreciate the value of what they meant to modern industrialization at the time it was a it was an amazing story and those are those are great stories to hear well of course it was a totally different story for me because not only did we know henry but his wife clara went to school with my grandmother <laughs> i mean uh, right and well, you're also talking at a time when detroit had like you said you went to a sacred heart we had i think there was something at one point 36 small catholic schools in the detroit diocese right and now there might be four, five at, at well, best? There's a few more than that, but not a lot. I think yeah. it's in the not like it was. Every, every neighborhood in those days yeah. had its own parish and its own church. It is. It, so, yeah. yeah. I mean, well, I'll tell you another story. Um, the phone rang one night 
shortly after the depression started at my grandfather's home. And my father was in law school at the time. My grandfather answered the phone and he said, Ed, to my father, uh, come on. And they went out in the kitchen and they got all the pots and pans out of my grandmother's kitchen. They got in the car and they drove out to Edsel Ford's new home at Gawkler Point. They went in and Edsel said, Mr. Tyson, yes. He said, we're having a terrible problem here because it's so dry in this house. Every time we turn around, we're getting shocks. And my grandfather said, well, you need humidifying radiator covers. That's the problem. You need to get humidity in the air. And that's what my grandfather did for a living at the time was sold humidifying radiator covers. So my grandfather went around, put pots of water on all the radiators in the rooms that the family were using. And then he measured all the radiators and eventually had radiator covers made and installed. My father went up to the nursery and spent time talking with the Ford kids, especially William Clay. And William Clay was just a little boy at the time. And my father said, do you like your new house? And he said, I like Wednesdays. And my father said, Wednesdays? What's special about Wednesdays? Wednesdays, I get to go into town and get my hair cut, and I only have the driver with me. And my father thought, what a terrible life for these kids to be actually imprisoned. I don't care if it's a luxury mansion, but you're imprisoned. And the only kids they could play with, there was a schedule established and designated approved children would be brought in to play with the Ford children because they were so afraid after the Lindbergh kidnapping. You know, you had the wall, you had broken glass on top of the wall and barbed wire, and it was patrolled by guards and guard dogs. And I thought, what a sad life. But I also found it very interesting that Edsel Ford always called my grandfather Mr. Tyson. Why? And my grandfather always called Edsel Ford Edsel. Because they'd known him since he was a kid. Sure. Well, that makes and sense. that was perfectly acceptable. Yeah. Now, I mean, my father, I mean, we always called the Fords whenever we talked to him, you know, Mr. Mr. Ford. Right. You know, we always thought that was appropriate, but uh, now, it was an interesting life. Absolutely. When did you kind of bring it up a little bit to, to the 70s? When did you climb into a sailboat and start to be a and sail full time? Okay. After... After I got my master's degree at Wayne State, I had joined the club in 1968 when I was 21. And I thought, I am not going to spend 30 years just paying dues and becoming a life active member. I'm either going to be involved here or I'm going to quit. So some friends said, well, you should sign up and take sailing classes because it's a good way to meet a lot of people, you know, younger people your age and, and have some fun around here. And so since it was wintertime, the first thing I did was join the dance class and right. met a lot of old people. There were eight couples in the dance class. But I'll tell you, every time I ran for office, I had eight boats out of the dance class. They always came over and voted for me. <laughs> but anyway, that summer, I joined the Scott program and learned to sail. And I was just doing it to meet people. And I thought, well, you know, sailing could be fun. Although I'd always liked power boats in my life, but you know, this could be fun. Well, by the time the season was over, I was not only hooked on sailing, but hooked on racing. And the next year I got involved with starting to teach sailing, which I did for over 25 years. Yeah. I just loved it. Now you are known as the rules guy. You are, are the rules director <laughs> for DYRA, and you've been doing that a long time. When, well, did, when did those sort of merge? Okay, what happened is in the, the 70s, um, it became very obvious to me that there were need in a couple of areas for people. One of them was in running races, and so I became a certified race officer. And the other one was that 
we needed judges, especially judges who would work with kids. So I started to spend a lot of time learning the rules. And eventually I did become a certified judge also. And I still, I, I hear protests at all of the junior regattas. I've been doing it for years. I've been doing it since about 91, I think I started. So I, you know, and then I got involved at U.S. Sailing. In fact, I chaired the race officers committee there. Um, I worked with the rules committee. Uh, the, the rule for finishing that they just revised in the last rule book, I wrote the revision before that with the head of the rules committee because it was what they had in the rule book was wrong. And I said to the chairman of the committee, I said, Dick, the definition of finishing in the rule book is wrong. We don't even rule according to the way the definition's written. And he looked at me and he said, you're right. He said, you got a few minutes. So we sat down at the hotel where we were staying for a U.S. sailing meeting and rewrote the definition of finishing. And that was in the rule books for a number of years. They, I was kind of proud about that. I used to sit in on a lot of the racing rule uh, committee meetings, uh, discussing rules and changes to rules with the people. I refused to ever get on the committee. I probably could have gotten on if I'd asked, but I never wanted to do that. That's just too political for me. You know, I'm new to junior sailing, and we ran a regatta last year at which you were our referee, and I watched you handle a couple of protests with young kids. And I, don't, I didn't know you from a hole in the ground, and I, I was amazed at the kindness of how you handled that protest. In fact, I said that to a number of people that were involved, and it was, I'm a, I'm a referee in football and basketball and a lifelong, and I, so I understand arbitration. But watching you explain to a second and a third and a fourth grader, I'm not exactly sure what it was, was really kind of fun and, and a treat. And I think sometimes, you know, we don't get – an understanding of why we're trying to teach kids to do it the proper way. And I, and I just, I wanted to give you a, a sort of a pat on the back because I thought it was really cool. Both kids went out of that little protest and that's the only interaction I've watched you with kids. But if you handle all the other ones, the way you did that one, I mean, DYA has got to be happy as heck because I just thought it was, it was really cool as a person who coaches it for a living. I just thought that was pretty terrific. Well, part of my philosophy in working with kids, and I've been doing it, as I said, for over 30 years, is trying to teach them. And you can't teach them by coming down on them. You, right. you have to be really kind of gentle and kind of work them through it so they begin to understand. Because if they don't understand the rule, how can they respond to it? It's why they call it a teaching moment. <laughs> you just have, you know, yeah. teaching is more important than the actual judging. I've always felt that to be the case. I mean, I was doing a regatta one year at Crescent, and a kid came up to me, you know, when because they have one group out on the water and one group ash ashore, and then they switch. Well, the kid came up to me, and he didn't understand a rule. And I spent about a half hour with him trying to go through this and explain it to him. And he didn't get it. And he went back out, did his next race and came in, spent another half hour with him. And he still didn't get it. And then after the next race, when he came in, we started going through it. And all of a sudden, I mean, I could just see it's like a light went off. All of right. a sudden, he right. understood what I was trying to tell him. What and a he moment. will never forget that rule. Yeah, yeah. And what a moment for you, because it's like you just – that's the thing that makes you want to teach. That's the thing that makes you want to coach. When you see the, when you see the light, eyes light up and you know that it, it sunk in, you can yell at me a thousand times because I didn't do whatever I'm supposed to do for your kid, and it's that one kid that uh, – it's, it's, it's the perfect moment. It really is. Well, yelling and being arrogant accomplishes zero. Right. It drives people away. I mean, and – Adults are just as bad as the kids. It's surprising how many adults don't really know or understand the rules. So, you, again, you have to be a little bit calm and easy with them and teach as well as rule, even the adults.
in the last 10 or 12 years, maybe talk a little bit what you think rules, sale rules have, have evolved to. Do you think there's been lots of changes in the last 10 years? Because there seems to be. There have been. I'm not sure how good all of them have been. The real problem, if you look at the rules from an international standpoint, you have the United States, France, and Australia on one side of rules issues, and Great Britain on the other side. And they're constantly battling with each other. And if you carefully read through the rule book and look at the way some of the rules are worded, you can tell the rules that were written by the British because they're slightly different. The English is a little bit different than our own. And this is a constant battle that goes on between the two groups. Uh, the British, I think, tend to be a little bit more conservative and rigid in their rules. And that was one of the reasons I never wanted to get on the Rules Committee. I mean, I, I was offered a position on the Rules Committee. I was offered a position going to uh, ISAF International Sailing Federation. Um, and I, I just didn't want it. I mean, and the, the president of U.S. Sailing said, well, if you're worried about the cost of traveling to the ISAF meetings, he said, don't worry, U.S. Sailing will pay for you to go. And I said, it's not a question of money. It's a question of the politics. And I don't want to be involved in that. Yeah. I'm fortunate enough in about an hour and a half, we're interviewing Dave Perry today. Is, I know, Dave. I know. And it's going to be a treat because he's obviously the, I would think, the guru of all rules. I think that's a fair thing to say about Dave. He's written lots of books and been involved in a lot of, of those processes. So this is kind of cool for me today, talking to a couple guys who understand the book and, and how, it, how it fits. Talk well, if, little, go ahead. If you wanted to see something that's really fun, you have to see Dave Perry and Dick Rose, who chaired the the rules committee for years to go at each other on the rules. Uh, I have been in a number of meetings with the two of them just going head to head on a rule. It's they don't fun. see eye to eye. They don't see eye to eye much. Um, they do. And most of the time they come to a, an agreement on things, yeah. but I, I think they love to argue about it. Talk a little bit about your position as a DYRA referee and, and how that fits and kind of how it fits the structure. DYRA has stepped out this summer from doing any rule, any racing, um, any sponsoring of racing because of the pandemic. So that kind of takes a summer off for you, I'm, I'm thinking. Well, it'll make my summer a lot easier, yes. Um, the reason for that, if you look, uh, U.S. Sailing has canceled all of all the, the regattas. Right. All of the major regattas on the East Coast have been canceled. ILYA has canceled all of their junior regattas. Um, we had, there was just concern here and the decision was finally made that DRYA would not be sponsoring any regattas. Yeah. Now remember that there is a difference between DRYA and the member clubs. Right. We should be really clear. DYRA is nothing more than an organization uh, like like the NCAA. It's a membership organization that gathers information. Right. If if you would look at U.S. Sailing, which is the organizing authority for sailing in the United States, they break, the United States is broken down into states. U.S. Sailing is broken down into regions. And one of the regional authorities is DRYA. There are 39 regional authorities in the United States. Now, it's also complicated because DRYA was organized in 1912 mm -hmm. by Harry Kendall of the Detroit Yacht Club and Harry Austin of the Detroit Boat Club. And it was to try and iron out conflicts between the various clubs in race states, racing rules, measurement of boats, uh, so that things could run more smoothly in the area. And it's been very successful, but it put DRYA kind of in a couple of seats because the clubs have turned over certain powers to DRYA. And they can take them back at any time. They have the authority to do that, which is why 
if a club decides that they're going to hold a regatta, they can hold that regatta. We have, we do not have that kind of authority. We only assist. We do not actually. Yeah, we have some clubs that are going to send out. I think me Crescent may be one of them. We're going to send out kids in four twenties with just one kid and one sail, as a making sure that we follow the law, follow the rules, and. It'll be interesting to see that 420 being sailed by one kid in a race with, against a kid with two sails and two kids in the boat. Again, yeah. informal racing is what it is, and it's not a big deal. But DYRA has a huge impact on the way we operate. I, I think mm -hmm. that's a fair statement. And I think that you have to have people like you who are knowledgeable. And sometimes it gets lost in discussion, but there has to be an arbitrator at some point. That's what referees do. Well, that's, that's why uh, – we have, I mean, there, there's, that's why we have the Junior Sailing Committee. The Junior Sailing Committee of DRYA is composed of the directors of the junior programs at the various clubs. Any DRYA member club that has a junior program, they can send their director to the junior sailing meetings. They're the ones that elect the chairman of the DRYA Junior Sailing Committee. Right. And so by working together, we've come up with uniform policies. Right. So that all of our clubs are pretty much operating the same, although there are differences in all of our programs because they serve the needs of, of their club, which are all different. But there's a certain amount of cooperation and coordination between all the clubs. And that has worked very well. It has made DRYA the envy of the whole country. U.S. Sailing came to me a number of times and said, is there some way that I could work with them to make all the other regional sailing associations operate like DRYA does? And I said, no. And they said, what? And I said, it's very simple. I said, in DRYA, we have, I think it's 25 or 26 clubs right now that are members of DRYA. But we go from Toledo to Port Huron. So we're in a very compact area, and most of us are actually between Lake St. Clair and the Detroit River, the upper part of the Detroit River. So our clubs are all very close together and can interact. When you start going to other RSAs, even ILYA, which is the closest to us, their clubs are so spread apart, there is no way that they could have the type of cooperation we do. And you can never make that work. Right. So to try and turn the other RSAs into a DRYA would never happen. I'm curious, just to get your opinion on this question, and it's just sort of a broad question, but are, are we moving in the right direction with junior sailing as it relates to having kids want to love to sail when they're 25. I think. And, and let me, let me add to that. I say that with sailing. If you look at us sailing's numbers, and if you look at the Federation, Federation covers high school sports. If you look at the burnout rate of almost all sports, they're at a high level because kids get pushed into things at an early age and it changes the way we look. But us sailing is a higher rate. Us sailing is up with hockey. They're at the top of the list of kids who start when they're seven, eight years old, and by the time they're 14, they don't have a love of it anymore. And I'm just wondering if, if, if you have any thoughts on that. Um, I do because I see the problem, and I'm not sure that I know an answer. But the problem is that we've been able to start at such a young age with our kids. And a lot of the kids are under a lot of pressure from their parents to perform which I hate. I mean, I've taken on a few parents directly myself yeah. to get them to back off. Let their, let their kids have fun. Even if they don't win as much, what's important, winning or learning to love the sport for their yeah. whole life? Yeah. Because the problem that we have is these kids come in and they get pressured, especially when they get in their teenage years. And then a lot of them get pressured from that into going into collegiate sailing. Then all of a sudden they graduate from college they have to establish themselves in a profession. They're probably dating or getting ready to get married and they're starting families. And so all of a sudden sailing is easy to just kind of drop while they, 
look at the rest of their lives. And we need to try and find a way that we can bring the fun back into the sport for these kids in their 20s and 30s. Because in the 40s, we get to see some of them that start to come back. And that's been keeping us going. But I don't know how long. You know, our numbers are declining. And if you look at demographics, they're getting older every year. Well, part of that's schools are closing. If you look at Gross Point, they're talking about closing elementary schools. We just have less kids. And mm -hmm. if you have a less, if, you, if the body that you're drawing from is smaller and you're not gaining ground, I think you have to rethink the formula as to what gets them back in the boat. And I think that's an important part of what it is that's going on at the moment with every sport. I don't think it's, we want kids to be multi-sport athletes, but we're becoming, soccer becomes a full-time year-round program. Hockey becomes 11 months a year to skate. If you play lacrosse, you have to play lacrosse 10 and a half, 11 months a year. And now, so the kids don't get that, the thing we got, go to the playground and, and sandlot and all the other stuff that goes with it. And I think that's an important point. And then all of a sudden they get out of college and they're under terrific pressure to perform at work, to get a job and be successful at work and to put in a lot of hours uh, to try and succeed in their profession. They don't have the free time. I mean, I look at the club when I was growing up. I mean, I'm 73, but when I was growing up, there were a huge number of members who would just come over to the club every night. Now they don't. I mean, now either they come over as a family or they don't come over. And so we actually, the number of people you actually see every night, even in the summer at the club, is down. Yeah. And if we didn't have the harbor that we had with all the people living on boats, which we've encouraged forever, uh, it'd be even worse. So I, I think I, it's just I, a problem. I had a mom yesterday explaining to me that with our first session for junior sailing, she was trying to figure out a way for her daughter to go to her macrame class, to come to junior sailing, to get in her volleyball class, and at the same time being able to take care of some tutoring that she needed to handle. And that was a, this was a, a third or fourth grader. And <laughs> it was like, and I always use this analogy, if you take a two-sport athlete in high school and he does his normal practices, his normal schoolwork, and his normal just life, you're asking that kid five days a week to base, basically work 68 hours a week. That's what it takes. At, most of us work 40 hours. Maybe some of us work 40 or 50, maybe 55, and maybe some work more. But the point I'm trying to make is if you all of a sudden told your, anybody that you know that, by the way, you're not going to work a 70-hour week, when Saturday comes, the kid sleeps in until noon, and they can't figure out why he's tired. I mean, it, it just, it's, it's insane because kids are never kids. And it, that's kind of the point. Well, I kind I look when I was growing up in the fifties, the day after school got out, we'd pack the car and go out to the cottage. Right. And then all six of us kids would be there at the cottage. You know, we had our friends there and we went swimming and did all kinds of things. Right. But we just basically had fun. Yes. And come the night after um, Labor Day, we'd pack the car and come back in the city and start school the next day. I'm waiting to see an ad in the paper for Harvard Leadership School for elementary students. I mean, I'm exaggerating, <laughs> but it, it, it is kind of those things. So, you know. I mean, we've taken away the fun out of our kids' lives. Yeah. And I, I went out of my way to try and make that happen with my kids. Now, unfortunately, my kids were four and one when my wife died. So I had to provide some sort of daycare for my kids even in the summer, but I tried to provide daycare in the summer where it could be fun. I didn't put them into programs where they'd be taking classes or anything. I put them in programs where they were playing games and swimming and, you know, because you need that. Absolutely. I think kids need that. And we're taking it away from our kids and we're making more and more demands on them, which I think are highly destructive to their real development. Without switching gears, but sort of the same subject, I have said on a number of interviews that I don't know that we understand the quality of the racers and the quality of sailing we have in this area. You mentioned that we're from Toledo to uh, 
Port Huron in terms of the DYRA area, like very geographically compacted. I just am amazed as sort of an outsider looking in at just the quality of people and process and sailors that are here. And I just wonder sometimes if we take five seconds to realize just how, what, how good we have it. Well, what's happened and what people don't realize is that with the birth of DRYA, the club started becoming very close. And if you look at all the clubs in this area, the clubs as clubs couldn't be more different. I like to say that anyone who wants to get involved in the boating scene, there is a club in DRYA that they can afford and will meet their needs. Absolutely true. And they're all different from Absolutely clubs true. like Crescent and Gross Point Sail Club to clubs like Detroit Yacht Club and Gross Point Yacht Club. And you can fit anywhere in between at a cost that you can afford. And all of the clubs work together. And that's yeah. the amazing thing is that there is a, a true relationship between all the clubs. And so what it's done is it's helped in sailing. It's helped to develop the skills of our sailors because you get people, if you want to get crew for your boat, you don't care if they belong to Crescent. You just want crew for your boat. So if they belong to Gross Point Sail Club or Edison or Boat Club or Detroit Yacht Club or Gross Point Yacht Club, you don't care as long as they want to come and they want to crew and crew effectively. So yes. you have a lot of cross training of skills that have taken place here and raised the quality of our sailors and given us a great deal of respect around the country. People look at what's going on in Detroit and they highly respect what we've done here. And I hope we can continue to do it. Yeah. I, I think we can. I mean, the numbers are going down, yes, but that doesn't mean that the quality is necessarily going down. Yeah. I didn't think you would be a pragmatist, but you really are. You find a middle line when you're discussing stuff, and I think it's really interesting. Well, you can't live in the past. Right. And you can't live in the future. So what you have to do is try and figure out where we are and what we can do to try and help things along as they are right now. Um, now, for me, people have said to me that they're amazed because of all the, the past Commodores at the Detroit Yacht Club I'm the one with the most forward thinking approach to things. And I said, the problem is that too many people get stuck in the past. They want to make things the way they were. I'm a firm believer that we have to try and figure out where we have to go in the next five or 10 years. That doesn't mean I don't like the past. I love the past. I'm a historian. Right. I mean, I remember more about the past than almost anyone else in this area. Right. But the past, someone said to me, what was my favorite time at the Detroit Yacht Club? And I said, the early 50s. And they said, well, should we try and make the club like it was then? And I said, I'd be your biggest opponent. <laughs> you asked, when was my favorite time at the club? And in the early 50s, I was a little kid. And I was over there all the time. And I was on boats all the time. And I was swimming all the time. And I was doing stuff with my friends all the time. I was over there watching movies and eating. And, you know, it was, I was just having a great time. Now, would that work today? No, society is different. We have to figure out where we have to be in the future. And what the club needs to do is to try and figure out by talking to members and talking with newer members and younger members where we have to go. And it's the same thing with sailing or anything else. If we don't start trying to figure out more and more where we need to go, we're going to lose our opportunity. Yeah. And now maybe, maybe I'm crazy or maybe I'm, uh -huh. I'd like to think I'm just hopeful. And I, I see that we do make progress. Sometimes it's stop and go, but we're slowly, I look at, at our sailing programs, our junior sailing today, 
from when I first got involved, I, I had a little bit of involvement in the 70s, but almost constantly from 1990. And it's totally different today. Yeah. And I'd like to think that we're going to continue to, <clears throat> excuse me, continue to change. I think we have to, if we don't try and figure out what, what we can do to help these children and what we can do to guide their parents, because sometimes their parents can be their worst enemies and we can be an independent. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, space set. Well, listen, I, we try to keep these to an hour, but I want to come back with you in August and I want to do just a story hour where we just talk about historical stories in sailing. If we could do that <laughs> maybe in August, if that would work for you. I can probably do that, yes. I think that would be really fun. Ed, this has been a terrific interview. I wanted to thank you for the time today. Um, the weather and a number of things have kind of kept us sort of going in, in different directions, but this has been a really a terrific uh, opportunity to talk to you and a real treat to and I hope the, uh, the viewers think the same. So thanks so much for your time today. Glad to do it. Hope you have fun this afternoon with Dave Perry. Thanks very much. <laughs>